All right, so how many of you guys have scars on your body? Sure, everyone does, right? Um, everybody, not that kind of scar, bro. <laughs> yeah, that scar. Um, everyone has a scar on their body, and every scar has a story. Uh, for me, the biggest scar that I have actually comes from my right ankle. And that actually started in uh, my freshman year of college. It was actually my freshman year where um, I was playing basketball with Pastor Sam and some of my college friends. And that's when we were a little bit more mobile because we were a lot more younger back then. And I remember just playing, and it was 2014, uh, not 14, 2004, so it was 10 years ago. And that was when the Detroit Pistons, right, won the NBA Finals. So for me, I pretended that I was Tayshaun Prince. Now, if you don't know who Tayshaun Prince, this is what he looks like. And the reason why I could resonate with him, because as you can tell, um, he could understand the skinny physique that I have um, in the way we play basketball. And so here I am, we're playing basketball. I get the ball, I take a shot. I land, and all of a sudden, I just hear a pop on my ankle. And I just collapse in the ground, I look at my ankle, and what happens is uh, the tendons near the ball of my ankle just uh, popped out. It was sticking out. It didn't hurt, it just, you know, it was just out there, thank, thank God. And so I go to the doctor, they tell me it's, um, you tore your perineal tendon sheath. Uh, which holds the tendon in place, and told me I have to go into surgery. Long story short, uh, I go into surgery, they rip me, uh, they rip me up, cut me up, um, repair my tendons, and I'm, it takes me three months to recover. But at least I get a cool scar story from that. And um, I think in the same way, when it comes to life, um, all of us have experienced some type of uh, wounds in our lives, right? I mean, experiencing wounds is inevitable. Um, but for many of us, uh, when it comes to wounds and scars, uh, there are certain scars, there are certain wounds that go much deeper than the physical. And what I mean is the wounds that go beyond uh, the physical body, the wounds that go beyond the external, uh, the wounds that are internal, the ones that actually pierce our hearts. You know, the wounds where we get messages, uh, when dark messages about who we are, what we're made of, and what we're made to be. And these are painful messages. And unfortunately with these wounds, they don't heal over time. They can't heal over time. And I know for many of us, as we are going to uh, discover that, we realize that it's painful. And we've been carrying it with us for a very, for a very long time. Um, what we call this is actually called the message of the arrows. And for many of us, I think this is sort of for our first time or for some of us rediscovering some of those wounds, some of those arrows. And I think for some of us, we haven't known how to take care of it or how to handle it. So we do what we do best, we uh, inoculate it, whether it's through drugs or whatever addictions. For some of us, we learn to cope with the pain through um, busyness and distraction. And for some of us, we just let it just bleed out. You know, and you know some of those people that just let it bleed out. But whatever spectrum that you're at, whether you're used to coping and burying with the pain or letting it just bleed out, you know that these wounds come up time and time again and ultimately they bring destruction to your life and even the people that you care about. And even if you want to love and care for the people around you or even try to love God or try to receive the love of God, it's so difficult. And... Um, oh, as we're going into this series on recovery and the recovery of our hearts, uh, we talked about the lost heart. Um, we also talked about the hopeless heart. Today, what I want to talk about is the wounded heart. Because I believe that as we're going and discovering the heart of hearts and why God loves the heart, uh, we're finding, I think many of us are finding in a place of conflict and saying, why is it so hard? to reclaim our heart? Why is it so hard to make our heart come alive? Why is there so much war? And, you know, um, we have this theme in the, uh, about Proverbs where it says, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. And the question is, why do we have to guard our hearts in the first place? You know? um, I think Brent Curtis from the Sacred Romance said it best. He said this. He said, should we live with hopeful abandon, trusting in the larger story whose ending is good, or should we live our small stories or glean on what we can from the romance while trying to avoid the arrow? Should we keep our hearts open to the romance or concentrate on protecting ourselves from the arrow? 
um, talking to one of my uh, small group members, when we're talking about this, she said it best. She was like, why do I have to risk my heart in the first place? Why does it have to be this way? Why can't I just open my heart and not worry about any pain? And this is, uh, I believe, a lot of the places where we find ourselves in. And I believe um, one, this one verse brings it all together. And it says in John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to bring life, and life to the full. It's funny because Jesus combines these two sentences together. And why does he combine these two sentences together? Because he's trying to tell us what's really going on with our heart of hearts. He's telling us that we're in the middle of a war. For example, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, I tried watching a movie with a couple of friends to watch 22 Jump Street. And I was 15 minutes late into the movie. And, that, and I, was, uh, I was like trying to run, going through hoops, getting to every train, running back and forth. And once I got into the movie, uh, going down and sitting down, and I was looking up to the screen, I had no idea what was going on. Like, I was 15 minutes into the movie, and I had no idea who the character, well, I kind of knew who the characters were, were, uh, were, but I had no idea to what the plot was going. It, um, for those who have watched the movie, it was the scene where they were doing spoken word, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, but that's where we're at. And I believe in, uh, for a lot of us, I think that's what happens. We're in the middle of a war, and we have no idea what's going on. So what happens is we go through life, we experience these wounds, we experience these uh, quote-unquote uh, meshes of the arrows, and a lot of times we have no idea why what's going on. Um, and what we have to understand and what we have to realize, and what I believe what God is trying to show us today is that we're actually part of a, gr a bigger narrative than we realize. That we're part of an invisible war that, uh, we don't, that we fail to understand. And if we don't understand that, what happens is we try to make pieces of our own existential experience, these fragmented pieces, without seeing the bigger picture of where we're at. And I know um, sometimes it's hard to grasp this whole idea about there's a war going on for our souls. And I think for the struggle with that is, one, either we don't know, and that's why we're here and talking about it, or two, I believe for some of us, uh, what happens is we know it, but we pretend that nothing's going on. Because for some of us, it's easier, and we think that it might be easier in our life if we compartmentalize this issue. I always have a hard time with that word, um, in this issue, and living our life. But if this peace, um, and if we don't embrace this peace, we'll go through life time and time again with wounds and messages, and we really won't understand what's really going on in our lives and the war that's within us and with, uh, what's outside of us. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. How do we recover from, this, from the wounded hearts that we have? And how do we make sense of that? And we're going to go to Ephesians 6 and find out. And so as we go to Ephesians 6, Paul is writing a letter to the church of Ephesians. And this, act, this letter is actually one of an encouraging letter. He's actually uh, reminding them of the call in their life. He's reminding them of of the spiritual blessings in their lives. You're reminding them and just encouraging them to live the life of the calling that they receive. But in the last part of his letter, he reminds them of a spiritual war. And the question is, why would he put this last? After all this um, exhortation and encouragement, why would he put this last? Because Paul is reminding these uh, Ephesians um, that any good thing that they have comes with resistance. There's opposition. And this is where we find ourselves in Ephesians 6. And he says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the question is, why does Paul say our struggle is not against flesh and blood? And it's really simple. He's saying there's something more going on in their lives than we realize. There's something much more bigger than what we can see. For example, um, there was... One time when I was walking in the streets of Staten Island, man, I kind of make it sound like it's the hood. <laughs> uh, I was just walking lecture with my friend. Um, 
it was, we were in the suburbs, so it was in the mall, so we are pretty safe, so we were just hanging out and... Uh, <laughs> streets of Staten Island. <laughs> oh God. So we were just walking along, and it was actually Halloween, and as we were hanging out, um, these two kids just came out of nowhere. I think they were hiding in the bushes, and they had um, eggs in their hands. And, you know, and they were about to egg us. And right before, right they were about to egg us, the, one of the kids uh, talked to the other one, and he's like, wait, wait a minute. And he was uh, talking to, my, to the friend that I was with, and he was saying, hey, don't hit that kid, because his outfit is nice. <laughs> and so instead, they egged me. <laughs> what jerks. You know, and you know, you know, and externally, you know, it's just eggs, right? It's just egg yolk that you could wash and whatever. But honestly, at that moment, internally, I got an entirely different message. And that message said, um, you have to be impressive and want to survive in this world. So what I did was in college, I suited up, as Barney Stinson would say, and um, I got, I dressed better, and I ended up, this is so shameful, but I ended up getting $50 haircuts in college. <laughs> Now, think about it, $50 for a college student. That shows some serious overcompensation issues right there. <laughs> and for me, that's what I thought, because hey, if you dress to impress, uh, if you have the right cut, uh, people won't bother you. Um, you'll survive, and you'll be liked, and you could survive in this world. And that's the message that I got that was underneath the surface. Thankfully, uh, God freed me for them, so now I get free haircuts from Henry. <laughs> my roommate and my barber, and guess what, it's for free. <laughs> but I think um, in the same way, I think what we have to realize that there's a much deeper, there are much deeper things going in our hearts. And what happens is the enemy comes and he sends these subtle messages, whether it's the voice of the world or these events or these moments in our lives where it hurts and it wounds our hearts to divorce our hearts to really live. And what happens is when we divorce our hearts, in which, which the adversary, the enemy, really wants from us, is that we build a persona of ourselves. My persona, $50 haircuts um, and a nice outfit, but that's not really who I am. I'm really this guy that does p bizos and just flips, things, flips words around all the time. And I was trying to build a life for myself that was, wasn't really me. And throughout life, when people were to love me or to just give me encouraging words or or even the love of God, it was so difficult because what they were seeing and what they were loving is really the self-preservation of my life rather than the person that was the heart of hearts. And, that, and that's what the enemy is seeking to do and in this picture and what he's trying to say where our struggle is not really flesh and blood but the spiritual voice of forces of the evil one, that there is a grander enemy that we have to see, that, that we have to realize beyond the natural. And it's, and it's the scheme to hurt and to wound your heart so that you don't live your life fully in your heart, as Pastor Sam shared last week, so that you can avoid living fully alive. Because if you were to live with your heart and discover your heart and live with your heart of hearts, with all the wounds and the scars and the pain, that's where you really meet God. And it's those very same places of your wounds is where God comes and he becomes the healer of your life. Where the good news is that he comes and as John 10.10 10 says, that he has come to give you life and life to the full. But it can only come where we come into the places where we remove the personas. Uh, we remove the self-preservation and come to the place we're the, mo the most vulnerable, the most difficult, where even the message, where we have received the messages for such a long time. So the question was this, um, how do we recover our wounded hearts? Like, how do we make sense of all this? And this is the first point. And the first point is this, is identify the message of the arrows. Um, and you have to recognize that you have an adversary. So my question to you is this, is what are the messages have you that you have been receiving in your heart? And how do you see uh, the enemy divorcing your heart and removing yourself from who, who you really are in your heart of hearts? And I pray the Holy Spirit will show you that, reveal that, and I pray that as you come in terms with that, that you will discover the truth and the gospel message that Christ has come to give you life and life to the full and heal those places in your life. But it just doesn't end there. There's actually more to this than that. And 
this is what will go next. And we're going to verse 14. It says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now the question is, why does Paul say, uh, put on the full armor of God? And you see here where you list all the things. Like, why put on the full armor of God? And it's really simple. He's telling us that we're actually warriors. And the crazy part of all this is that we actually have a role to play in all this. You see, when Paul is writing this, he's actually in chains. And as Paul is writing this, um, these Roman soldiers are around them watching him. And as he's writing this letter, he's um, contextualizing what the spiritual war might be like in terms of a Roman soldier. And he's very intentional about every piece that, of, of, the Roman, uh, of the Roman armor and how that relates to our spiritual war. And that's why he says, put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the feet fitted for the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, uh, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And he says that as you put on all these things, and you're equipped with the full armor of God, he says, stand. And the word stand is very important because Paul is saying that when you put on a full armor of God, you're not marching towards something. You're not in the offensive or any, of anything. You're standing. Like you're, you're standing your ground um, against the bully. Like you're standing a, a ground to, uh, against an opposition. In other words, what he's saying, you're standing your ground protecting, like you're protecting something in a fortress. And that fortress is our heart of hearts. Your, and that fortress is our souls. The fortress is uh, the hearts and the souls of other people. For example, yesterday I got a call late at night, at midnight, uh, from one of the college students. And usually when that happens, it's usually a bad phone call. And so I was preparing the message shoot, and I was just like, oh, God, this is going to be a long one, isn't it? And, you know, usually it's a drunk call or a problem call, and I was just like, oh, boy. Um, but when I picked it up, I was in for a surprise because um, they were saying, you have, you, peeps, you have no idea what will happen. And I'm like, okay, so what's going on? And to make a long story short, what happened was uh, three, three of the college students uh, met up with uh, a friend of theirs. And she was struggling with living her heart fully alive. And usually, and this is a Saturday night, mind you, and, and you know, they were telling me they were, they were wanting to veg out, watch some Pulp Fiction, bum out, and have some fun. And all of a sudden, this issue came up. And they were telling me that they fought for her heart, and they were saying that they talked. Um, through whatever issues that she was going through for five hours. <laughs> wow, five hours dealing and um, going through every heart issue, fighting and protecting to make to the point where she can come to a place where she says, yes, God, uh, I want you to fully make my life and full, make my heart fully alive again. And I was like, wow. Usually college students, usually I make fun of college students in, in my sermons, but this one, I would have to give you some encouragement on that because, wow, they were fighting for someone's heart. And guys, I think that's the great picture of uh, where we're meant to be. Uh, our lives as followers of Christ or people that are discovered, we're meant to be warriors, guys. I mean, a lot of times I think what we mistake in um, the gospel is that when we, when we get our lives healed or when we um, live our uh, lives for the gospel, we think it's just about being healed, but just about being whole. But the reality is, uh, when it comes to the gospel and what we see in this passage, what Paul is telling us here, is that there's more to it than just being whole. You're, you're invited to something much bigger than yourself. You're meant to partake in his uh, grand narrative and the co uh, cosmological war of fighting also for people's hearts. And you know, I think that's a lot of times what we forget as people that are following Christ. And sometimes we lose sight of that and we wonder why things get boring or things get routine is because we forget that we're meant to live for a cause. And a cause that's bigger and larger than ourselves. And it honestly, it's usually when um, we forget that, that we fall into petty things. You know, a lot of times people fall into petty sins and petty uh, moments. It's only because we lose sight of the grand narrative. You know, like in that story where, you know, 
when they're fighting for someone's heart, watching Pulp Fiction doesn't really matter anymore because they see something much bigger than themselves. And what I want to encourage you is this, is that if that's what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, the routine, I think God is trying to remind us again, once again, about the warrior heart in all of us. That we're called to fight and we're meant to be so much more than this. What the enemy wants to do is to keep us wounded, to be spectators like we're watching Gladiator. But rather, I do believe in um, the heart of God wants us to be the gladiator of people's souls, to fight for people's hearts, to live for uh, something much more greater than ourselves. So the question is, how do we recover our hearts? Um, how do we make sense of all this? And this is the final point, is discover the warrior heart within you. Know that you have a battle to fight. And my question to you guys is this, is um, what is the fight that, what is the cause that God wants you to fight for? Where, is he, where does he want, to, uh, want you to fight in? And to conclude, I want to say this. I think um, some of us might be in two different places. One, for people that are experiencing the messages or feeling the wounds, I just want to encourage you that the good news of the gospel is God is called the healer. He has, he has come here to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captives free. And that's the good news for you. And for you to meet with God and have him come and experience life to the full. And for the others that are coming to recovery, I want to encourage you to discover the warrior heart within you because you have a cause. You have a mission and a call much more greater than yourself. And to live for that cause and live for that fight. So will you please stand with me and see what God has to say for you. Father, we want to come before you this afternoon. We have a Father that formed our heart. He knows every story of our lives. And as Pastor Billy was sharing with us today, the dark messages of our lives. What are they? You know, a lot of people think dark messages happen in our weakness. It's not true. How many people here saw the World Cup? Well, you go, which game? I don't know. You've been watching? You saw Brazil. How many, how many people expected Brazil to lose 7-1? to one? No one, right? Did you watch Brazil again play again after they lost? They lost again. 
zero to three. And the World Cup is in Brazil. And they're not there. And, they, and they're supposed to have invented the game. They're the best. Now, if you watch them play the second game after they got obliterated by Germany, you would see in their body language that they quit. For them, first place was it. Third place? I remember playing a basketball tournament when I was in high school, and we lost, and we were playing for the third place, and we, were like, we just left. We didn't bother playing. We quit. And let me tell you this. What Peeps is talking about is for most of us, we quit in places we're actually good at. We used to be good in love. Or you thought, at least you thought you were. Tell someone you're good at love. You're like, that's weird. Why are you asking me to tell that to people? <laughs> and you used to be in love and you're like, you know, I could never n live without this person. And then all of a sudden, they did something stupid, really stupid. And you're like, I quit. And then after that, you quit on every relationship. Or you were really smart in junior high. You like peaked like super smart geek, you know? Did like math in your head and calculus and all that. And then you went to college and everybody else, you know, were smarter than you. The message of the arrows take place in the places of talent and strength. And that's why they're so painful because it was a surprise. It was unexpected. And that's why when we thought we had an expectation of how our life was going to go, and then we get capsized, we don't know how to trust anymore in what we believe. And that's when the dark messages settle in. And then that's when you quit in everything you do. You don't want to put your heart in it. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a job, whether it's life. That's why Proverbs talks about the wisdom from Solomon, right? That to guard your heart above all things for it's the wellspring of life. It's the epicenter of passion. Folks, what we're talking about today, it's more important than a Sunday service and it's more important than just a sermon. It's about the rest of our lives, how we're going to live it. And, and what the gospel and what Christianity is about is about helping us recover what we've lost. Because the talent and the strength and the gifts that God has given us is who we're meant to be, to be the glory of God, for us to be fully, fully alive in God's glory. So today, what we're asking for you to do is to recognize that message, that dark message, and say, God, take it out of me. Help me believe again. That's the, I mean, New York, that's the cynicism that we all have. Yeah, right. That can't happen. And God said, in Ezekiel, he'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. So let's pray for that right now. Will you lift your hands with me and respond to the gospel? If you're a Christian, I mean, you already know this, that, that Jesus said in Luke 4, I have come to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Now, if, if you're a seeker seeking, this is good news for you because you want to believe in life again. You want your heart back. And one of the reasons why you don't hear anything, you go, is God even up there? Is because you lost your heart. The Bible says when you seek him with your whole heart, you shall find him. So today, as the psalm says, God holds a record of all our tears, all our stories in his heart. Today, I want to pray that you would know he knows your story. And he wants to help you believe again. Have a heart that's new, restored, healed. So you can be the best of who you're meant to be.
and reflect the glory of God. So he knows my name. Let's, let's, as we sing this, let's make it our prayer. And as we lift our hands to God, let's give him the arrows and say, God, I give you permission to heal my heart. I have a maker. He formed my heart. He formed my heart. Before close in prayer today and give you the benediction I would like to give you a cultural prophetic picture of what the gospel is supposed to do to your life in 1985 Michael Jordan this is very important because we're going to watch the World Cup letter this is related to sports Michael Jordan broke his foot he was sidelined I don't know what's wrong with Derrick Rose I don't know why he's not playing yet but um Mike, this is Michael Jordan. He broke his foot. And people were questioning, will he ever be the same again? He comes to the playoffs in Boston Garden and scores how many points? 63 points. This is why the greatest basketball ever lived. I mean, don't even argue with it. This is like Sports Center right now. I mean, 63 points is still the most points ever scored in NBA history in a playoff game. A lot of times when people come to church, they, you know, the leaders and pastors tell you, be good, be good, live better. Don't do that. Tell someone, don't do that. Don't do, stop doing that. Don't do that. And you're like, I'm trying, I'm trying. But my girlfriend's annoying. <laughs> I'm really trying. And, and, and the problem is, you're, it doesn't matter if you're the world-class athlete, if your leg, leg is broken, your foot is broken, you're not gonna be able to jump. And the message of Christianity for too long has been the fact that you need, no matter how hurt you are, no one cares, you need to suck it up and you need to start moving in the right direction. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about healing over time, giving God permission to let God's hand come on your life, heal every wound, every arrow, every message, and then you make history. That's the gospel. And then I go, who wants that? Everyone's like, me, me. It's just the process is painful. But will you allow God to come in and let him heal, redeem you? That's the message. It's that invitation. I will give you a new heart. Remove from you the heart of stone and give you the heart of flesh. Let me pray for you. Will you bow your heads? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All God's people say, 
Amen. God bless you. We'll see you soon.